you've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it, but you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bob here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. And our guest for this week's show is a real estate crowdfunding expert, Jillian Hellman. Now, Jillian is CEO and co founder of RealtyMogul.com. She's responsible for the company's strategic direction and operations. Jillian has underwritten over $5 billion worth of real estate and was previously a vice president at Union Bank, where she spent time in wealth management, finance, and risk management. Jillian is a certified wealth strategist holds a Series 7, Series 63, and Series 24 licenses, and has a degree in business from Georgetown University. Now, you guys, you definitely don't want to miss this show with Julian, where she shares her outlook for the future of commercial real estate post-COVID. But more specifically, we discussed, and she shares her honest perspective on the hospitality and office sectors and what the future might have in store for those two very impacted uh, real estate asset classes during this pandemic. And so with that, I'm excited to get on to it with Jillian. But before we do, just have a few quick housekeeping items. Guys, like I've announced the last couple of weeks, we are live with our third mobile home park investment fund. If you want to learn more about partnering with us on future opportunities, go to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com to download our PPM and offering memorandum. We've been investing in mobile home parks for nearly a decade. It's our core competency, and we kick ass at it. We're really good at it. We've got a strong track record. We've got assets in multiple different states and are phenomenal at the mobile home park investment space. So if you want to join a team of proven operators that know how to find phenomenal off-market deals and know how to operate them as well, go to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com to learn more. Moving on here, just want to remind you of the partnership program that we offer called bringkevinadeal.com. And this is where I will pay you upwards of $200,000 for any deal that you bring our way, mobile home park or parking lot, that you refer to me that I end up purchasing. To learn more about this opportunity and to download my deal acquisition criteria guide and to also submit a deal, you can go to the website, bringkevinadeal.com. Again, bringkevinadeal.com. Guys, if you love what we're doing here at the Real Estate Investing for Cashflow podcast, please review it if you haven't done so already and also subscribe to the show so that you are notified when brand new episodes come out. Lastly, I want to remind you of the free 30-minute phone call I offer each and every week. This is where on Friday afternoon, I set aside three 30-minute time slots to jump on the phone with you, discuss everything and anything regarding real estate investing. There is no ulterior motive. This is just a way for me to connect. I've been doing it for years. I love it. I love talking to you and I would love to help you on your real estate investing journey. Okay. Go to kevinup.com to sign up for that free call with me. And now guys, without further ado, I'd like to get onto the part of the show that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Jillian Hellman. So here we go. Alrighty, guys, it is my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, CEO of Realty Mogul, Jillian Hellman. Jillian, how are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Very much appreciate it. And um, just give our listeners a sense of geography. Where are we calling you at today? I'm actually in Florida. So uh, I'm call, calling you live from Miami, Florida. Okay, fantastic. Well, Miami is the, one of the only few locations in Florida that seem to getting the, they're having the effects of the lockdown a lot more severe than that of the remainder of the state. So I just saw an article that uh, this Labor Day weekend, at least in Palm Beach County, uh, that the all the public beaches will be shut down for Labor Day weekend, which is uh, quite interesting. But in any event, well, I appreciate you jumping on here with us today, uh, Jillian. Uh, excited to have you back. And so, you know, for those folks that aren't familiar with you, uh, that don't know um, who you are and what it is you do, maybe just take a few minutes and tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, you know, a little bit about Realty Mogul as well. Sure. So I'm the founder and CEO of Realty Mogul, and we're a private equity firm that invests in commercial real estate all around the country. Um, we invest with operating partners who have localized expertise, and we also invest you know, directly um, into transactions. Uh, we raise most of our capital through crowdfunding. So we have a digital platform, realtymogul.com. Uh, investors can go on there and invest in a, a whole variety of transactions with us. They can invest in one of our diversified REITs, real estate investment trusts. 
Um, for accredited investors, we also offer individual properties that investors can invest in, an individual shopping center, individual apartment building, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, I got my start in banking. So I went to uh, business school at Georgetown University, came out of there and went to work for Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi and their U.S. subsidiary Union Bank. And I started you know, really in banking, learning the ins and outs of banking, working with a lot of high net worth individuals and the connecting tissue or connecting theme across that was all of our wealthiest clients in the bank were real estate investors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I grew up in a real estate household. Uh, My grandfather developed property in Los Angeles. My mother was in luxury residential real estate. My father owned some commercial and industrial properties through his business endeavors and always loved real estate and knew that I wanted to go into real estate. And so left the bank and started Realty Mogul back in 2013. Okay, fantastic. And to date, what's the total transaction uh, volume that Realty Mogul has uh, placed? I guess you could, from an equity standpoint. Yeah, so we've invested in about $2 billion worth of real estate. Um, it's over $550 million in equity. So if you think about, you know, we're placing equity and then there's typically debt on the properties, usually, you know, 70 to 75%. Um, so it's north of $2 billion in real estate. Majority of that has been in multifamily. It's about 65, 70% of our transactions are multifamily. Mm-hmm. And we've invested in over 15,000 apartment units. So a, a pretty wide swath of apartment units across the country. Okay. And then, you know, given that there's uh, many other different crowdfunding platforms out there, real estate crowdfunding platforms to be more specific, you know, what separates Realty Mogul from, you know, many of the others? Yeah, I think one is optionality. You know, we give investors the ability to in, to invest in a specific transaction or to invest into one of our diversified real estate investment trusts. And the real estate investment trusts have, you know, two different strategies. We have one REIT called Mogul REIT 1 that's really focused on an income strategy. And we have another REIT called Mogul REIT 2 that's more focused on value add multifamily, more of a growth strategy. So if an investor wants, you know, diversified pool, they can get that on our platform. If they want to invest in a specific transaction, they can also find that. Um, we also have a great track record. You know, we've uh, we've been in business now over seven years. Uh, we've had, you know, 38 transactions go full cycle. So we acquired them, they got renovated, they got resold. Um, so that's been a huge part of building trust and credibility with investors is them actually seeing that, you know, those deals go full cycle and there's been, you know, some successes. You know, there's always risk in real estate. We always tell, tell investors, you know, if you're projecting 15, 16, 17% returns. I mean, that's that's certainly not without risk, but I think that we've done a, a good job of underwriting deals, a good job of identifying transactions and, and offering those up for investment from our investors. Yeah. And what is the long-term strategy with the majority of properties? Is it to go full cycle? Is it a you know, three to five year horizon depending on the deal? Yeah, I'd say our average transaction is between a five and 10 year hold. So on the five year deals, you know, those are more value add, you're going to get in, you're going to renovate and you know, you're going to look to get out. Um, But we also have other cash flowing transactions that are 10 year holds where it's, Mm -hmm. you know, renovate and then hold for cash flow for the long term. Yeah, fantastic. I appreciate that. And I love to pivot the conversation we could, you know, the um, the times that we find ourselves in are quite unique right now. Um, as we were talking about before we started recording, you know, we're both uh, working remotely now uh, from from home offices, maybe you're not in your home office, but uh, just in a remote sense. And um, again, we're many, many months into this pandemic as this is getting recorded, just give listeners a sense of a context here. It's September 1st. And so it might be a little delayed as far as when you're listening to this. But in any event, more than likely, when you're listening to this time, Times are still a little unique in, in that the the pandemic probably hasn't gone away, and um, and we haven't really met November yet as far as the election time frame. You know, um, as it sits today, unemployment is still in the double digits, and there's really not any end in sight. And um, you know, there's a um, speaking to commercial real estate. There's a, a number of commercial real estate sectors that you know, are feeling the initial pain much worse than others. You know, hospitality, you know, pretty much right out of the gate, we're feeling a lot of the pain. Retail is feeling some of the pain. Even senior living, you know, given that this, um, uh, you know, the pandemic of COVID-19 ultimately affects those that are, uh, uh, you know, of a uh, greater age than those that are younger. And so, um, and, and then I think personally, I think there's many other real estate sectors that are, you know, going to see a little bit more of a delayed reaction as we kind of work through the coming months and years. And so um, what I love to, to do, Jillian, is just kind of get your perspective on, you know, I guess the, the, the first thing would be just what is your outlook for the overall um, uh, for the overall consideration of commercial real estate post COVID, you know, once we actually get back to whatever the new normal might be, what do you, you know, what are you sensing as far as commercial real estate in general? 
It's so hard to generalize, honestly, because I, I think that it's going to really depend by property type. I mean, I yep. think there's going to be, if, if you want me to generalize, a well, lot of assets are going to be totally fine and a lot of assets are going to be totally not fine, right? Well, let's do that. Let's let, Good. Perfect. Perfect. That, that's a great answer because it, it is really hard to generalize. Um, so let's talk about uh, you know asset class. I mean, let, let's start with hospitality because I mean, would you agree that it's probably the one that is feeling the most pain out of everything at, at this present time? Yeah, I think hospitality is is really struggling, although maybe not as much as, you know, some retail where, you know, no mm. tenants are paying. I mean, you're starting to see at least some hospitality increases as far as occupancy. You know, I, I flew out to Columbus, Ohio, I guess it was last week or the week before to go tour a property that, that, we're, uh, that we're underwriting. And I was actually shocked at how crowded the hotel was. Mm. Um, I stayed wow. at the Lake Meridian. There were people buzzing around. There were people in the bar. There were people in the restaurants. I, you know, didn't, didn't go any of those common spaces, but it kind of walking in and out of the hotel, you know, hospitality is no longer at 0% occupancy, right? There is still some retail and some office, which is at 0% collections. So, you know, it depends on the hotel. Hospitality obviously got hit very, very hard, you know, early in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not big hospitality investors. We, we've made over 300 investments since I launched Realty Mogul. We currently have two hotels in the portfolio. Got it. Um, they're both performing terribly, right? I'm, I'm a direct <laughs> and honest CEO. They're performing terribly. And I wish that I, you know, had no hospitality exposure, but, you know, it's the reality of, of the reality. But I, I think that, I think that the, the well-located, well-branded hotels, if they can hold on, they're going to be okay, right? Yeah. People's memories are short. I think that people are going to go back staying at Marriott's and Hilton's and St. Regis's and all of that. And I actually think luxury hospitality is doing incredible. If you look at, you know, like the Amon resorts, if you look at Blackberry Mountain, Blackberry Farm, I mean, those are all booked, right? Because a lot of folks that would otherwise travel to Europe and spend the summer in Europe are all doing domestic yeah. travel. Um, so I think the luxury hotels are going to do fine. I think well-located, well-flagged hotels, you know, are going to do fine so long as they can hold on, but it, it's going to be rough for a while longer. And I, I think a big piece of that is business travel. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at my own travel patterns and the travel patterns of our company and, you know, myself and our chief investment officer are still actively getting on planes and flying. Um, but we are not having anyone else at the company getting on planes and flying just because yeah. of, you know, the liability today. So it's, it's dramatically changed even our own business travel. So would you say that's a fair statement that, you know, the larger operators, the ones that have deep enough pockets to kind of hold on and weather the storm, uh, more than likely will be fine and they'll find their way out of this thing. Whereas maybe the, you know, the medium, the smaller size operators that, you know, all, you know don't have the same type of liquidity. They're, they're the ones that ultimately might find themselves in, uh, in deep water. I mean, is that a fair statement? I, I think it's fair. I think the other element is financing. So mm -hmm. a lot of it depends on how these transactions are financed. You know, if you have a CMBS lender that is very strict, that is not going to work with you, that feels very differently than, you know, a bank lender who's going to give you six months of forbearance tacked on to the end right. of the loan, right? Yeah. I mean, at this point in time, what, what, I mean, where are we at as far as CMBS defaults? And I'm assuming that a lot of it's tied to retail and hospitality. I mean, last time yeah. I looked, it was like 16 or $18 billion. I'm sure it's higher than that now today. Um, any idea? I don't know the exact number, but you're definitely spot on that it's, you know, it's retail, it's hospitality, it's malls, kind of a subset of, of retail. Um, and, and look, I, I think there's going to be real losses there. Right. And, and that's the risk that, you know, a lot of these bondholders yeah. took when they were buying CMBS, but mm -hmm. you know, there, there's assets that are going to go back to the bank, if you will. And so let's talk about, let's move on to retail then. Uh, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, I mean, literally memories are short, you know, people will get back to business travel, you know, the idea of like the higher end hotels. I mean, people are doing staycations now, which is exactly what they're doing. They're, they're traveling by car to some of these nicer luxury hotels versus going to Europe and what have you. Um, my wife and I just did the same thing a couple of weeks ago down at the beach or we have a favorite hotel we go to and it's a staycation for us. And, you know, it's one of the nicer resorts on the beach where we live. Right. And, um, and so ultimately, you know, well-located, well-positioned and, and, uh, and it was busy. It was very busy. Retail, on the other hand, let's talk about that for a second. And, um, you know, kind of what, what the future forecast looks like for retail. We already knew that, you know, retail was, uh, trends are changing. You know, e-commerce is having a big impact on, on certain types of retail assets. And, you know, this could have ultimately sped up some of the slower dying strip centers or malls, what have you. But let's just talk about it overall. What are your thoughts on retail? Yeah, look, retail was in a world of hurt pre-COVID, right? We overbuilt retail in this country. It's just a fact. Now, 
this recession, though, I think is different than a lot of the historical recessions and that this is very micro market, even even property level specific. I mean, we have retail assets in our portfolio where collections are in the 70 percent range and we have retail assets where the collections are in the upper 90 percent range. Hmm. So it's very you know market specific, very property specific. I mean, if you think of, you know, grocery anchored or pharmacy anchored retail the grocers are, are having a bang out business, right? The pharmacies yeah. are having a bang out business. Now they typically don't pay top dollar rent, right? Those are usually the tenants that you use to drive people to the center to get top dollar rent from the mm-hmm. other tenants. But it, it really depends on the specific retail, you know, location, whether it's grocery anchored, whether it's pharmacy anchored, you know, whether they're mom and pop tenants, whether, whether they're national tenants, you know, what the financial situation of those tenants is, you know, restaurants are starting to come back, you know, even here in Miami where indoor dining, you know, has been outlawed, you know, thankfully there's a lot of opportunity to do outdoor dining in a city like this. So I think that'll fare better than, you know, the East coast in the winter time, right. Where it's going to be very challenging to do outdoor dining in, um, in New York and in some of those surrounding markets or Chicago is an example, right. You're not going to have outdoor dining in the middle of December in Chicago. It's just not going to happen. So retail is going to really depend on, again, the micro market, the micro property, I'm still a believer in well-located retail. If yeah. you can buy retail at the corner of Maine and Maine, that deal is going to do fine. And, and if there's the ability to pick up that property in light of what's going on with COVID, that doesn't scare me. I'm not afraid of that. Um, but to pick up, you know, retail that is not well-located, that is not Maine and Maine, you know, if there's one shopping center that's going to survive in a certain town, I want to be in the one that's on Maine and Maine, not yeah. on the one that's on, you know, third and fourth streets, right? So <laughs> I think that, um, in general, retail is getting a bad rap, but, you know, I mean, we're seeing retail trades in, you know, nine caps, 10 caps, 11 caps. Um, and that's really interesting, right? I think mm. that there could be a lot of opportunity there just because of how bad of a rap it's getting. But again, you got to buy the right asset in the right market. I am not a proponent of go buy, you know, obsolescent retail. That's just yeah. not a good strategy for anyone. Is there actually a lot of retail trading at present time? I mean, you know, as we work through this uh, pandemic or it just when you say they were trading at 9, 10, 11 caps, I mean, is that just generally speaking? That was pre-pandemic to be totally okay. honest. Okay. Um, we we invested in a shopping center transaction in Florida and we were, you know, projecting double digit cash on cash returns in the first year. This is a, mm. a closed investment, not an open investment. But um, I, I think there's... There's opportunity in retail because of the fear, but I think you have to be a very good operator and you have to have very, very localized knowledge. Um, we're not afraid of retail with the right operator in the right market. Got it. Got it. Let's talk about red, the redhead stepchild in the room, which is office. You know, I, I, <laughs> we're talking about like we're, we're remote right now. Most companies throughout the U.S. Uh, went remote, maybe with a very skeleton crew that have kind of come back into that space. But um, I think a lot of companies have realized that they can be just as productive with their employees working from home, have a much better quality of life, you know, save a lot of overhead expenses on a big office space that might not be utilized any longer. And so what does that long term projection really look like? on the office segment. And, um, you know, I think more importantly, what do we do assuming that it doesn't go back to normal, assuming that, you know, uh, you know, uh, companies only need 50% or 30% of the, the space that they might have in the past. Um, how do we repurpose? Is there, is there a way to repurpose a lot of these uh, office assets across the country? Yeah, look, office is scary for a number of reasons. I, I was just reading the news earlier and Pinterest is paying $90 million to get out of an office lease in wow. San Francisco. Um, but on the flip side, you hear about JP Morgan in New York who's saying we're bringing everybody back to the office, but it's going to be in waves and shifts. So I, I don't know where office ends up. I mean, people's memories are pretty short. Mm-hmm. And I think that while we've had a great time being remote, while my team has been incredible, I, I do fear onboarding new team members in a totally remote environment. And we've actually been hiring during this. We just hired two senior folks on our team and we've been onboarding them remotely and they're doing great, but there is something that you miss out not being in person. Yeah. And so, you know, not to use our own experience as the experience of everyone, but I, I don't think that office is going to die. Um, I think that there still is going to be a need for office. And then you ask yourself the question, okay, do companies have a smaller footprint or do they have a larger footprint because of COVID they want to create more social distancing? Ah, and I, I don't know where we land on that. Um, you got to remember office leases have long, long terms. Mm-hmm. So it's not like, you know, all of a sudden there's going to be, you know, 90% vacancy in office. I mean, a lot of these terms are three years or five years or 10 years or 15 years. So it's going to take time for that all to work its way through the system. There's also the question of does suburban perform better than urban? 
right? As you see people migrate out of cities and there's still a need for offices, do they end up in, you know, suburban offices? Um, you know, we've done office transactions with high quality tenants and we're, we're generating, you know, high cash on cash returns on, on certain transactions. And I think a lot of those tenants stay in place, but there's going to be others who don't. Um, so it, it's hard to say. Again, it's very micro, right? I'm really concerned about the Bay Area. You know, you've already had Twitter come out and say they can, everyone can be remote. You've had Google come out and say, you know, remote at least through next year. You've had Pinterest cancel this big office lease. I mean, the Bay Area is going to get hit very, very hard in office. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm similarly concerned about New York, uh, although New York always comes back, right? Think about after 9-11. Everyone was freaked out. No one's going to want to work in a high rise. No one's going to come back to the city. And, yeah. you know, once that sort of flushed out, it, it wasn't reality. So it'll be interesting to see how long it takes and sort of where we where we settle. Yeah, no, no, very interesting. I guess at least in the Bay Area, you can say that there's a massive shortage of uh, residential housing. So ultimately, maybe you could repurpose some of those office spaces into residential housing. <laughs> yeah, I think that's the, the logical thing. I mean, that's yeah. what hotels, we, we've been looking at a lot of hotel conversions as well. Hotels to multifamily, hotels okay. to, you know, micro studios. In fact, I just saw an office to multifamily conversion in Stamford, Connecticut this morning across my desk. Huh. This was a pre-COVID issue, but they, they converted a suburban office into multifamily with some really cool penthouse units. It looks a little funny. It looks like you're going into an office, (laughs) um, but the interior units are nice. So I I could see people repurposing office. Um, I could also see, you know, less office being built, right? Uh Um, It, you know, takes a a decent amount of time to build office, two or three years. So you're going to see a lot of that pipeline, you know, just evaporate effectively. I think if people don't already have their debt lined up, their equity lined up, you're probably not going to see as many new construction Mm -hmm. starts on office. So that'll help with, you know, the absorption of the increased vacancy as a result of COVID as well. How about the co-working segment of the office space? I mean, like that's a very unique uh, a sub-segment of, you know, a lot more densely um, uh, positioned folks in a room in an area. Um, do you think that will survive? I mean, obviously that's a, that's a trend that kind of came about over the last decade. Uh, but do you think that particular trend will survive the long term? I think the concept will survive, Yeah. but I think that the concept will survive through existing landlords. So like we already know WeWork is a terrible business, right? We know Regis is a terrible business. We know all of these co-working companies, you know, whether they were the sexy technology ones, a la WeWork or the historical ones, like they're bad businesses, right? They, they have asset liability mismatches. They're just bad businesses. But I think that for for some of the bigger landlords to carve off some of their space to have an offering like that, I think makes a lot of sense. And, and probably even more so during COVID, right? They may have to redesign those office spaces, but for a lot of office users, if they are comfortable working remotely, they're not going to need a full-time office, right? There's going to be flexibility around that. So I think that there's a need for it. And that's why companies like WeWork had, you know, great revenues and great revenue growth, but the business model has to change because you can only, sur- you know, you can't survive in an unprofitable business model. Yeah, no, I agree. I love to, uh, to pivot a little bit here. We talked about some of the asset classes that are feeling some of the pain. Uh, we didn't touch on senior housing, but that's okay. I want to, I want to uh, flip to the other side here and, uh, you know, multifamily manufactured housing um, and self-storage are just a few of the, you know, what I, I classify as like trophy winners, right? As far as, where we're at through this pandemic and, you know, what the collections rates have looked like. But, um, you know, what's your opinion of um, how those asset classes might perform? Or is there going to be any impact on those um, once we hit a point in time where the stimulus runs out? Again, we're in the manufactured housing space. So, you know, we, we do have a number of residents that are unemployed throughout our, our portfolio. We've got 13 states that we own assets in. And, uh, um, uh, you know, I'm of the mind that probably about 96% of them uh, are actually receiving some type of unemployment benefits, which have been substantial, you know, fairly substantial over the past couple of months up until recently. They haven't rolled out phase two yet, but um, uh, we haven't had uh, that much of a downtick in collections. It's been it's been pretty darn good. And I can tell you, I lost many nights of sleep in the middle of March as we rolled into April, not thinking that was going to be the case. Um, but everyone's smiling, at least in the multifamily and manufactured housing space. But what are your thoughts long-term? Does that last? Yeah, I think long-term multifamily, mobile home parks and self-storage will do fine. You yeah. know, there, there may be a blip. You know, we, we could see negative rent growth. We could see, mm. you know, increased bad debt. We're, we're already seeing it, frankly, in, in certain assets mm. on the bad debt side. But long-term, I think it's going to be fine, right? The, the big difference between this recession and the GFC, the 2008-2009 recession, is we were totally overbuilt, 
right? We had way too much inventory on, on the housing stock. And that is not true today, right? We are, we probably have a deficit of over a million, you know, um, a million units where in 2008, there was just a, a ton of stock. So I think that from an occupancy perspective, it's a very different world in 2020 than it was, you know, in the last recession. Um, but again, it depends on the market and it depends on the asset, right? I mean, I think that class C, true workforce housing is going to have a lot more issues around collections than, you know, yeah. class A or class B. I think that class B will will come out of this as the clear winner, right? People who are living in class A apartments, if they lose their jobs, they're going to go down and go live in class B. Um, I think class C is going to have collections challenges, but I think that, you know, net net, I think that it will be okay. And I think that this is going to be a much faster recovery. So sort of peak to trough in the 2008 uh, recession was like six and a half years, somewhere between six and seven years, called six and a half. W- what I'm reading and what I believe based on what I'm reading is that this recession or this cycle is going to be three to three and a half years. So it's going to be much faster, right? The therapeutic drugs for COVID are already, you know, a lot better than they were in March when we all sort of, you know, went on pause. Um, you know, I, I think that there will be a vaccine by this time next year, probably Q1 or Q2 of 2021. And I think once that happens, consumer confidence is going to go up. And once mm-hmm. consumer confidence goes up, people start spending money, jobs start coming back. Um, it's still going to take some time, right? I don't think we get back to normal until 2023, sometime in 2023. But that's very different than the last recession that took us six and a half years. Yeah, no, no, I half agree with time. you. And, you know, so we can both agree there's going to be some distress in, in the marketplace over the coming years. Will Realty Mogul play in that distressed marketplace? Absolutely, if we find transactions that we think make sense. I mean, our our mandate is to find risk-adjusted returns, right? And you can define that in any number of ways. We, we don't invest in hospitality, so we're not going to be playing in the hospitality sector. Um, other than that, you know, we look for great operators. So for example, if you came to us and said, hey, you know, there's a portfolio of distressed mobile home parks, we have experience with these kinds of transactions, and here's the business plan, and we think that makes sense, and we think the risk-adjusted returns make sense, you know, we're more than happy to, to invest in that space. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think that there's less distress than people think think there is though, Mm -hmm. right? I, I, you know, based on our own experience, there were some really interesting deals to be had in March, right? When everyone was freaked out about COVID, there was a (laughs) ton of fear and I'm not seeing that as much anymore, right? There will be Mm. distress in, in, in hospitality. There will be distress in retail. You know, that'll start to play out. I, I don't know that we get true distress in multifamily as a result of COVID, um, I think that it may bounce back quickly enough that, you know, most folks can hang on to their properties, especially with the way that lenders are behaving in this cycle. Yeah. You know, lenders in the 08 cycle were foreclosing. Lenders in this cycle have a heart, right? They're saying, we'll work with you. We'll give you forbearance. You know, no one could have planned for this. It's a virus. It wasn't, you know, mismanagement, financial mismanagement, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there'll be slim to to limited multifamily foreclosures that are really truly COVID related, right? There's always foreclosures that are usually operational mismanagement or over leverage or, you know, lack of proper planning on the capitalization, et cetera. But, but true COVID, I think it'll be pretty limited in that sector. Do you feel like the, uh, the length of time it takes us to pull out of this recessionary period will, you know, you think whoever gets put in the office in November will play a role in that or a factor in how long it takes? Uh, look, a hundred percent. Right. And you'll never know the other side because you're only going to have one person in, in office. But I, I think that, you know, we're, we're struggling in, in politics today to sit down and have rational conversations. Yeah. Right. There, there's so much division that's happening in government. And, and look, I don't I, I don't care which side of the politics that people are on. I just am really gunning for the ability to sit down and have a conversation and to listen, right? Like we, we've forgotten how to listen as a country and that really concerns me, right? Again, like it's good that we have decisive beliefs, right? It's good that there's a variety of beliefs. Um, I think that there's fear in the commercial real estate world around, you know, what Biden and, and the Democrats may do. I think that's probably largely unfounded other than maybe taxes. You know, I mean, we've been talking about getting rid of 1031 exchanges for decades. It's never happened, right? I mean, there there's... There's all kinds of issues that are always concerns and that, you know, the Republicans always say, you know, this is going to be bad if the Democrats are in office. And, and most times, again, other than taxes, that hasn't changed. But we, we've got a lot of real problems in the country. You know, we, we have a, a lot of issues that I think we should be having 
productive dialogue around, and I'm concerned about the lack of dialogue, right? And, and I think that's a cultural problem that we have in our country. I think that the reality is that the Fed is going to behave the way that the Fed is going to behave, whether it's a Democratic or a Republican organization, yeah. I, I think. Um, and, you know, there's this slogan of don't fight the Fed, right? If we keep printing money and we keep pumping money into the economy, which I think we're going to do irrespective of which party takes office, I think mm-hmm. that's going to drive the recovery. It's not going to be, is it the Democrats or the Republicans, you know, and, and and the impact to taxes, if the Democrats do come in and they pass, you know, increased taxes, that's going to take a, that's going to take a while to play out, right? That's not going to happen immediately. I think that, you know, it's going to take 12, 18 plus months to play out and, and really hit people's pockets. So I don't know that that's going to impact our immediate recovery. Obviously that has impacts, you know, 18, 24, 36 months down mm-hmm. the line, but I think that the Fed is the big player here, and I don't think they behave materially different, irrespective of the administration. Yeah, I agree with you on that. You know, you know switching the topic over to crowdfunding, I, I, you know, are there any any big changes uh, to speak of in the crowdfunding space that that our listeners should be aware of? Any any material changes that are either have come down the pike or are coming down the pike that um, are important to know? Yeah, I mean, the only one that comes to mind is the SEC just released guidance on the new definition of an accredited investor. Mm, that's right, yeah. Um, so historically, an accredited investor was an individual with an annual income above $200,000 or $300,000 with a spouse mm-hmm. and a net worth or a net worth over a million. And there was this argument in the industry, I, I wasn't part of the, the lobbying, but there was an argument in the industry that, you know, what about all of these people who have financial sophistication? What about folks who are CPAs? What about folks who are attorneys? What about folks who, you know, are financial advisors that really understand finance, right? And it's less about how much money they're making and more about their financial sophistication. Mm -hmm. And so the SEC, it's, it's launching in like 55 days, but they just announced that if you have a series seven, a series 65 or a series 82, which are all financial, um, advisor licenses that you're now going to be deemed an accredited investor. Now, that in and of itself is not that exciting to me, right? It's it's not that big of a population. But what's exciting to me is that they're acknowledging that sophistication is, is, is equal to financial success. And so what I'm hoping that means in the future is that they will also include folks who have a CPA, you know, folks who are certified wealth strategists, folks who are attorneys, um, you know, those types of people who have other designations, which are also indicative of financial sophistication. So it could be good news for, you know, investors alike and, and, you know, crowdfunding firms like ours alike to expand that universe of who an accredited investor is because we've been limited, right? We've been limited to strictly, you know, the highest net worth investors in our country. And when you think about inequality in the country, well, might that be some small portion of it? Maybe. (laughs) Right. It's been what, probably 20, 30 years since they made any adjustments to that definition of what an accredited investor is. It might even be longer than that. I can't recall. I remember looking it up at some point, but it it was quite a long time. Yeah. Yep. Well, good deal with Jillian. This this has been a lot of fun here. I appreciate you coming back on the show and um, how I'd like to round this out is rolling into our golden nugget segment. And you you shared a lot of uh, golden nuggets with us already today, but if you had just one final golden nugget of advice or wisdom that you could leave with our listeners that might inspire and motivate them as they progress in their own real estate investing career, uh, what would that one last golden nugget be? Look, one of my favorite quotes is opportunity dances with those on the dance floor. You have to be in the game, right? And and we saw this even with COVID, right? There were a lot of firms that were pulling out of the market. You know, they said in March, we're not writing offers, we're on pause, you know, we're afraid. And I think that a, a deal that um, got, got the offer was written in March. And, and now I think that that deal looks like it's being acquired for a very cheap price, right? A very favorable price. Time will tell, obviously, and, and there's risk in all real estate deals. But my point is, you have to stay in the game, right? You have to stay in the game. Keep writing offers. It doesn't mean that, you know, you have to do every deal, but you have to stay in the game. You want people to know who you are. You don't want to go hide in a, in a hole and cower, you know, just because of COVID, right? There's lessons to be learned. There's deals to be looked at. Even if you personally don't feel comfortable making an investment in the next 24 months, I have no problem with that, right? We, we're not a, a an organization that ever thinks that anybody should invest if they're not comfortable, but, but learn, right? Use that time to yeah. stay in the game. Use that time to learn. Use that time to analyze deals, to look at transactions, to go walk deals, to go fly to deals. I mean, there's a huge competitive advantage right now for people who are willing to travel. I agree. And that's yeah. not to say that everyone should go get on a plane and travel. You've got to make your own determination. But 
for me personally, you know, I, I have made the determination that I am comfortable traveling. Mm -hmm. And so I will get on a plane and I'm winning deals as a result of it. Right. When you can stand face to face across from a seller and say, I want to buy your property so bad that I just got on a plane and flew to you in the middle of COVID, <laughs> that gives them a lot of certainty that you're going to close. Right. And that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. And, and it's it's meaningful. So I think you have to define, you know, that own risk profile for yourself as, as far as the health stuff. But opportunity to dance is with those on the dance floor. So, you know, keep dancing if you want to keep learning. No, I love it. I mean, you, you make some very valid points there. And again, as this, this, this will probably be about six weeks until this comes out, but um, in any event, I still think we'll be in the midst of it. And I think there'll be still a lot of fear revolving around flying and traveling, what have you, but uh, no, I mean, the same thing over here. I'm, I'm the one in our company that's traveling. It sounds like you and maybe a few other seniors are, um, are traveling within your company, but I'm the one that's traveling and there's lots of other folks in our industry that aren't. And uh, we've won a few deals because of it during these, uh, um, very uncertain times. So now great point that you make there. J Jillian, it's been awesome having you back on the show. Really appreciate you coming on folks. If you want to learn more about uh, Realty Mogul and, and, and all the offerings that they have, you can go to their website, realtymogul.com. And so Jillian, that's all I have. Thank you so much Thanks. for coming back. It's been a lot appreciate of fun. It. Alrighty guys, that's all we have for this week's show. And so until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Buck, wishing you huge success. You take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. We'll see you next Monday morning.